Turn your Bibles to uh, 1 Kings chapter 20. 1 Kings chapter 20. As much as uh, Pastor and his family say they appreciate us coming, we are uh, so blessed by the opportunity to get down here. We would have before, I think, but uh, our borders have been locked up. And the last first opportunity we had, we, uh, we came down. We wanted to be here for a couple years now. So. <clears throat> 1 Kings chapter 20. I'm going to read a pretty big portion of this passage, but first I wanted to look at what it says there in verse 28. 1 Kings 20, verse 28. And there came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said, the Lord is God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys. Therefore will I deliver all this great multitude into thine hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Truly that's God's desire. It's been mentioned more than once this week, if you've been listening that God's desire is that you would know Him. When He speaks, Amen. when He prophesies, when, when He proclaims, when His Word goes forth, you would know it's Him talking. When He acts, when, when, he, when he works, when He changes things, you would know that He is the Lord. Amen. And that's what He wants. He wants to be known as the Lord God Almighty. That's what He's going to do in this passage of Scripture. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank You for Your Word. Pray God you be with us today, Lord. You know the preparation that has gone on. You know the prayers that have gone up. But uh, the delivery in this opportunity is all you. I pray God that you would open up our ears and, and uh, eyes to behold wondrous things from thy law. I pray, Lord, that not a uh, word that is spoken tonight would go out in vain. It would drop, drop without doing according to your will. I pray God we'd be attentive and ready. To hear what you have for us. We thank you for your son. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Go so back to uh, verse 1 there. Let me, uh, let me get comfortable reading a little bit of scriptures. And Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his hosts together. And there were thirty and two kings with him, and horses and chariots, and he went up and besieged Samaria and warred against it. And he sent messengers to Ahab, king of Israel, into the city, and said unto him, Thus saith Ben-Hadad. Now, if you're not familiar with King Ahab here, the king of Israel, this man is about as stable as water. Yep. At any moment, he could, be, he could be solid, liquid, or gas, depending on the temperature of the room. He, uh, he's, he's, he's double-minded, the Bible says... He, double-minded man is unstable in all his ways and to make matters worse he went and married a, 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 a devilish awful woman that basically steered his ship whithersoever she would and uh the bible is going to here in this passage seem like it's painting him in a little bit of a positive light he's he's, he's learning lessons here as, as awful of a man he was um but there's just another picture of the grace of god <laughs> This, this man was rotten, and yet God here is, is trying to teach him some things. And most importantly, he's trying to teach him, I am the Lord. You shall know that I am the Lord. Let's continue reading in verse 3. So the king Ben-Hadad sends these messengers. In verse 3, he says to Ahab, Thy silver and gold is mine, thy wives also and thy children. Even the goodliest are mine. Verse 4. The king of Israel answered and said, My lord, O king, according to thy saying, I am thine all that I have. The messengers came again and said, Thus speaketh Ben-Hadad, saying, Although I have sent unto thee, saying, Thou shalt deliver me thy silver and thy gold and thy wives and thy children, yet will I send my servants unto thee tomorrow about this time, and they shall search thy house and the houses of thy servants, and it shall be that whatsoever is pleasant in thine eyes, they shall put it in their hand and take it away. It seems like the king Ben-Hadad, the opposing king to Ahab here, 
he didn't believe his words either. And so he said, okay, you've said that all of that is yours is mine. Well, let's put the rubber to the road here. I'm going to send my men and we're going to take whatsoever we will. Verse 7, it says, The king of Israel called all the elders of the land and said, Mark, I pray you, and see how this man seeketh mischief. For he sent unto me for my wives, and for my children, and for my silver, and for my gold, and I denied him not. And the elders and all the people said unto him, Hearken not unto him, nor consent. What, what kind of crazy thing is this? You, you're, you're the king of Israel, this, this great nation, and you're just going to let an op opposing king come in here and, and just proclaim whatever he wants of yours and take it away with him? They said, don't consent to this, right. the elders. Right. Wherefore, verse 9, he said unto the messengers of Ben-Hadad, Tell my lord the king... All that thou didst send for thy servant at the first I will do, but this thing I may not do. And the messengers departed and brought him word again. And Ben Hadad said unto him, or sent unto him and said, The gods do so unto me, and more also, if the dust of Samaria shall suffice for handfuls for all the people that follow me. You know what he's saying? I got millions of people following you, following me. And what do you have? He, he's now he's now boasting this king of all that he has following him. And what are you going to do, King Ahab? <clears throat> I did a little bit of a math here, and it's uh, it's an exaggeration. But Ben Hadad, essentially, when you look at uh, <clears throat> how much of dust is in a handful and, and the volume of, of of dust and all that, he's saying he's got like 403 billion people. Now that's a slight exaggeration. We barely have 8 billion here, right, on this earth. But nevertheless, he's proclaiming, you don't stand a chance. You might as well just give me what I'm coming for. Verse 11, And the king of Israel answered and said, Tell him, let not him that girdeth on his harness boast himself, as he that putteth it yeah. off. Ahab here responds with such confidence now. I guess he's gathered the elders together. He's no longer in that mood that he was yesterday where he said, oh, all that I have is yours. Now he's saying, you know what? Don't be boasting in all that you have. Don't, don't boast that those that are girding on his harness boast themselves against him that putteth it off. He, he's now proclaiming with confidence back, you know what? I, enough of this boasting. Verse 12, read down. And it came to pass when Ben-Hadad heard this message, as he was drinking, he and the kings in the pavilions, that he said unto his servants, Set yourselves in array. And they set themselves in array against the city. And behold, there came a prophet unto Ahab, king of Israel, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou seen all this great multitude? Behold, I will deliver it into thine hand this day, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. And Ahab hears this word come from the prophet. The prophet's declaring exactly what the king just said to him. The enemy had just said to him, Look all this great multitude that I have coming against you. The prophet of God says, Look all this multitude that you have coming against you. He's absolutely affirming, You're outnumbered, Ahab. You don't stand a chance. But... That God here has promised he will deliver the multitude into his hand. Why? To get glory to himself so that Ahab shall know that he is the Lord. Right. Amen. Amen. Verse 14, and Ahab said, by whom? <laughs> Didn't God just finish saying it? I will deliver him into thine hand. Amen. He proclaimed very clearly through the words of the prophet that I will be the one, God Almighty right. speaking, that will deliver right. all this great multitude into thine hand. And the first response from Ahab is, by whom? Right. <laughs> and he said, here's the prophet, thus saith the Lord, even by the young men of the princes of the provinces. Then he said, who shall order the battle? And he answered, thou. Thou king will order this battle. Right. Verse 15, then he numbered the young men of the princes of the provinces, and they were two hundred and thirty and two. And after them he numbered all the people, even all the children of Israel, being seven thousand. Now an exaggeration, but ben had just said, I've got millions, I've got millions, I've got scores and scores of people to your few thousand. Yep. Seven thousand two hundred and thirty-two. 
The fact that this king, it even came to his mind, Ahab, that who's going to order this fight, who's going to leave this battle, is preposterous. He sees the multitude. God says, I will deliver him. He says, well, who will do it? Right. The Lord God Almighty will do it. He's going to do it in order to glorify himself right. above all things. Yep. So we see here the king gets the response. King Benedict gets the response from Ahab, this boast that came out, but... He's not a boastful man. He's not a confident man in himself or in the Lord God at this time. You see, again, he's all over the place. Right. Is he confident? Is he bold? Is he strong? Is he brave? We don't know when it comes to this King Ahab here. But God is strong. Right. And God here is the one that has promised yeah. the victory unto Israel. Keep reading down in verse 16. And they went out at noon, but Ben-Hadad was drinking himself drunk in the pavilions, he and the kings, and thirty and two kings that helped him. And the young men of the princes of the provinces went out first, and Ben-Hadad sent out, and they told him, saying, There are men come out of Samaria. And he said, Whether they be come out for peace, take them alive, whether they be come out for war, Take them alive. That, that's the confidence that Ben Hadad said. That he's got so many numbers, he's not even going to slaughter those 7,000 some odd men that are coming out. He's just going to capture them and right. take them alive. That's his desire. He's probably planning to bring them on his slaves. He's probably planning to bring them on just like he had promised earlier. The wives, the children, the young men, everything is going to be his. He wants these alive. A confident king. But this king is not confident enough, or he, he's, he's confident in himself. What he's not understanding is that there's God Almighty God coming against him. Right. Verse 20, And they slew everyone his man, and the Syrians fled, and Israel pursued them, and Benedict, the king of Syria, escaped on horse with the horsemen. Verse 21, And the king of Israel went out and smote the horses and chariots and slew the Syrians with a great slaughter. Verse 22, And the prophet came to the king of Israel and said unto him, Go, strengthen thyself, and mark, and see what thou doest. For at the return of the year, the king of Syria will come up against thee again. That's hardly what you want to hear as right. a type of celebration once you just right. finish a great and wonderful victory. But this is how Christians ought to be as we walk our Christian life. Amen. We get a great victory from God Almighty God. He promises through His Word that He is certainly going to give us the victory, multitude or not. Whether we have many or few on our side, God promises right. the victory here. And then as soon as it's done, as soon as God follows through with what He had promised to His people. Do you know what He says to the prophet? Strengthen yourself. Yep. Mark, see to yourself. Keep an eye on yourself. Be on guard. Be watchful. Be prepared. Because the enemy is coming again. Right. And that's the same thing that we're going to experience in our Christian life. You'll be walking, everything's going great, suddenly you'll get a great big victory in God, and you know certainly that He led you in the right path, and He did exactly what He had promised you in His Word, and you're flying on high, and you're feeling so great in God, and God's going to say to you in that still, small voice, as He often does, keep on guard, yeah. keep watchful. Just when you think you've reached that zenith, that mountaintop, you, you're flying high in the Lord, well, get, get ready. Yeah. Because right. within the year, another battle, another challenge is coming. We don't understand, especially these young ones, that the Christian life is not a sprint. The Christian right. life is a marathon. The Christian Amen. life takes endurance. It takes, it takes determination. It takes grit. It takes, it takes just like camping out here has done. You don't just come for one day and leave and say, I went camping. No, you stick it through. Amen. And that's the same thing with your Christian right. life. You don't just come in, have one victory, you're saved, something goes great, you get a family member saved, you're like, whoo, that was great, wasn't it? And then you settle back in. No, there's another challenge, there's another right. battle, there's another Amen. Battle. Coming right on the heels of the one that you just faced. Right. Now here we have, as God goes through the prophet, he says, strengthen yourself. Mark, see what thou doest. Within a year, the king of Syria is coming again. Now what sometimes happens to us, we know something's down the line. We know that there's a challenge awaiting us. This king, he was waiting, he was strengthening, he was preparing perhaps. Did he fall into fear? Did he fall into frustration? Was there some sort of inner anxiety, discouragement? 
when is this battle going to come? And, and, and maybe even looking out over top of the hills and seeing that the king of Syria is also amassing a great army. He, he's doing the same thing, strengthening, preparing, getting ready for the next battle. And as of yet, God has only said, prepare yourself. He has not given him any such promise of deliverance that he saw before. Right. Did you notice that? And so I can picture this king, especially a king like Ahab, a bad example, if as it were, kind of, kind of, you know, stressed out, pulling on his collar, wringing his hands, like, okay, our, our army's ready. Are we ready enough? You know, we 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 prepared ourselves for battle, but but are, are we strong enough? You know, th this king, he just keeps getting bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger. Did we see the whole multitude last time? Did God surely deliver us as He had promised? And he, and he's perhaps stressed out at this time. Was he wondering if his days were numbered? We can continue on down. In verse 23 it says, And the servants of the king of Syria said unto him, Their gods are the gods of the hills. Yeah. Therefore they were stronger than we. But let us fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And do this thing. Take the kings away, every man out of his place, and put captains in their rooms. And the number and number thee an army like the army that thou hast lost, horse for horse, chariot for chariot, and we will fight against them in the plain, and what? surely we shall be stronger than they. And he hearkened unto the voice, and they did so. Yep. Ben Hadad obviously didn't know the Lord. Right. He had thought God had some sort of limited domain. Right. Well, these gods, he calls him, right. <laughs> blasphemously, right. these gods are surely the gods of these high places, the yep. hills. And this is why they won this great valley. This is why 7,000 were able to conquer our multitude. Yep. Because this God only works up high in the mountains. <clears throat> and so he says, horse for horse, Man for man, yep. soldier for soldier, let's take them to right. the valley. And there we will fight them, and there we will overcome them. Verse 26, And it came to pass, at the return of the year, that Ben-Hadad numbered the Syrians and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. And the children of Israel were numbered and were all present and went against them. And the children of Israel pitched before them like two little flocks of kids. But the Syrians filled the country. So there's no King Ahab running his mouth off at the king. There's, there's no King Ahab here receiving a promise from God that he's going to overcome. There, there's, there's no feigning of confidence they go out into this valley called Aphek, and there they meet a full country of Syrians as just two little flocks of kids, right. maybe lambs. Right. <laughs> Verse 28. And there came a man of God. Amen. <laughs> The king must have been just shaking, just just nervous as all get up, just just again not knowing what to do with himself. And then comes the man of God. Amen. <clears throat> Remember this: that whatever's going on in your life, the man of God is there, saying something to you. Whether it's a Sunday night, Sunday morning, a Wednesday night, whether it's just passing by and hearing the preaching of God's word come through your ears. Right. Perhaps that's the exact moment that it was needed. And listen, be attentive. Verse 28, There came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said, the Lord is God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys. Therefore will I deliver all this great multitude into thine hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. As if they already didn't know. Wasn't right. that what he had said in the first promise of deliverance? You shall know that I am the Lord. Right. It didn't really sink in, did it? Again, God proves himself to you. Right. Right? And, and how soon do we forget? Yep. So what does he do? In grace and mercy and love and faithfulness, he'll show himself again right. to be who he said Amen. he was. 
What a good God he is to us. Amen. So these two little flocks of kids are standing before a full country of Syrians. And God comes and says, because of what they blasphemously said about me, because of what they boasted among themselves, that I have some dominion, that I am limited, that my reach is only so far, that I can't overcome them in the valleys, because of these things that they have spoken against the Lord God Almighty, I will destroy them. Amen. So that I can be lifted up. That's right. what he's saying. So that all will know that I am the Lord. Amen. Yeah. Not a Lord, right. not a God, right. not one of the gods, not just the God of the... I am the Lord! That's it! Settle! Hill, valley, dry land, dirt, water, lakes, rivers, streams. He's the Lord over it all. Right. Amen. Verse 29. And they pitched one over against the other seven days. And so it was that in the seventh day the battle was joined, and the children of Israel slew of the Syrians an hundred thousand footmen in one day. Amazing. So Israel saw this great victory, but I think leading up to it, they had not only this physical valley that they were in, but I think there was this spiritual valley as well. It's another illustration of the Christian life. We have our hills and we have our valleys. We have our highs and we have our lows. We have those, those times of great victory. We have those times that we are struggling. We are right. suffering. We are hurting. Amen. Yep. Right here, Israel is facing a great and deep and dark valley, having not heard the word of God from the man of God. But glory to God, he had a great victory planned for that day, and he did so. According to his promise, and according to his will, the enemy comes and boasts and proclaims awful things against the God of God's. And God shows himself strong yeah. on behalf of those who he loves and those right. he cares about in order that he would receive glory from the situation. Right. Amen. Continuing on. And it's proven, of course. Verse 28. The man of God said... Though they have said, and though the word has said, world has said, and, and don't people that you know out in the world say such strange things about God, and they make these proclamations, and sometimes it hurts because you know the Lord, yep. and He wants you to know Him, and, and you have that relationship, and they say, oh, oh God doesn't answer prayers, right. and you're like, He does, and He has. Amen. Although God doesn't really care about you, but He does. Amen. <laughs> Absolutely He does. Right. <clears throat> Don't worry about it. Okay? People will say all sorts of things. And the Bible gives you two options for answering a fool. One according to their folly. Yep. yep. <laughs> lest they be wise in their own conceits. Amen. And two... Don't answer them at all, Amen. lest you be like unto them. Yeah. Yep. Right? Make those decisions. You, you, you don't cast your pearls before swine. Right. But trust that God will answer. Amen. Amen. Even if you don't. You know, sometimes you can let words that the enemy says just roll off of your back. Yep. And just trust yeah. that God heard it, and God knows, and He's just waiting for that opportunity right. to show Himself to be the Lord. Now, <clears throat> going on with that illustration about the hills and the valleys of, of the Christian life, and, and the, the, the hills and the valleys of, of, uh, of and, and the highs and the lows of, of just knowing God. So, one thing that I've, I've been thinking about recently is when God is the God of the hills. And he's also the God of the valleys, and we know that. Yep. When he's the God of the hills, when he's 
the king of kings, as the Bible said, when he's the, the high and lofty one, when he's our returning savior, when, when he's the Lord of all, whose train fills the temple, whose presence literally burns mountaintops and then levels them. Right. Isn't it easy to, to laud him and to praise him and yeah. to, to give him glory sometimes? Doesn't it seem just just fitting and, and, and suitable that 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 miracle healer, the, the provider, the, the, the one that takes a, a bag lunch and multiplies it out to feed thousands, the, the resurrected Savior, doesn't it doesn't it seem easy to, to worship and save and, and, and praise him and right. love him? Remember the time he came riding in on the feast day and they all shouted, Hosanna in the highest! And, and, and cast palms before him and praised him. I think, it's, I think it would be pretty easy, especially in a big crowd, to, to, to praise and to celebrate and to rejoice in God. And here you have a bunch of like-minded people and you're praising and celebrating and rejoicing in God. But remember what he wrote on that day. Right. Just, just a colt, just, just a, just a little, a little baby mule. Low and meek he was. And this is not trying to, to, to split God open or divide him up into hills of God and valleys God or anything, but, but this is the God that I. I forget about in my daily walk. Like I say, I, I celebrate him and I rejoice in all of his overcomings and his conquering and his, his, his fearlessness and his strength. Remember when he was meek? Remember yeah. when he was lowly? Remember when he was in a lot of ways just like me? Right. We need to trust our Lord when he's up in the hills, yeah. Amen. when we're up in the hills, when we're feeling great, when we're feeling good, That's right. when we're succeeding in the Christian life, when everything seems to be just so, just right, just great, when his promises are coming true, and we're a little confident and boasting here as, uh, as Ahab was, you know, we're, we're, we're feeling good about our walk, we also need to trust him in our valleys. Amen. We also Amen. need to trust Him when we're, when we're down low and we're, we haven't heard the Word of God. We haven't heard His promise. And we're saying, where is He? We have this great multitude. We have the enemy before us. We have this challenge and this struggle before us. And, and, and is God even here? Has He heard? Oh, He's heard. Amen. Yeah. Right? And He's there with you. Remember to see Jesus who just rode in, rejoicing with those that rejoice. The psalms were spread before him. The crowd crying out with, with blessings and, and honor and, 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 and thankfulness and, and just, just lifting him up on high. Remember the Lord as you are there with him and just celebrating and happy and, and joyful and strong in the Lord. But also see him as he was when he soon gave his life over. Yeah. See him as he was dumb before false accusers. See him as he was giving his back to the smiter. See him right. as he was carrying his own cross. See him as he was feeling and even saying, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Have you been there with the Lord? He's been there with you. That's right. See him as he's blasphemed, as he's mocked, as he's dying. Yeah. You gotta remember, God is the God of the hills, and He is the God of the valleys. Amen. If you're on a hill, and you're on a valley. He's God all the same. That's right. And He's strong in the behalf of you, for His own sake. <clears throat> now, remember Moses in the Old Testament. He made the statement: "A prophet shall come; and she, he shall be like unto me." That's right. I've, I've, uh, your, your, your pastor, he is, he said that a little while ago and it's, it's stuck with me <clears throat> thinking about that message. And I, I think, I think one part of that is, is absolutely true that we, we, we see Moses in his 
godliness. He mm -hmm. said, a prophet will you raise up like unto me. Moses says, I'm going to be your example. And the, and, and, and the prophet that shall come, he was pointing to Christ. Right? Right. He was pointing to Jesus Christ. He said, he'll be like unto me. Yeah. This wasn't an arrogant statement right. for Moses. You know what he was saying? He's that that prophet is in me. Right. That prophet is enabling me. Amen. Christ is empowering right. me. And everything good you see about me, it's God right. in me, Christ right. in me, the Spirit of God upon me and working in me. Amen. He says, a prophet shall come and he'll be like me, right? right? Because he's in me and he's right. working in and through me. And everything good, everything wonderful, everything blessed you see from me, Moses, your, your teacher, your man of God, your leader, is only because of the workings of God, only right. God, showing himself strong within me. But also... We talked here about Moses' godliness. I think there's another side to that scripture that I've been meditating upon recently. Moses' godliness, but what about God's Mosliness? Yeah. What, what about the humanity of Christ? What about the Christ that we saw in Isaiah 53? That, that yielded himself, that, that submitted himself, that, that humbly served, that was, was, was tempted at all points like as we are, yet without sin. What about the God that thirsted? Right. What about the God that wept? What about the God that prayed? What about that wonderful prophet, Jesus Christ, who, who experienced all that we have and are experiencing here on this earth? And he was even oppressed by us. Right. Yep. All the while being oppressed alongside of us. Right. And in the end, his end was entirely for us. That's right. He died on that cross. He shed his precious blood. He gave himself over willingly. He became the lowest of the low. Yep. Humanly speaking. Amen. He was an off-scouring, even as his people are, the Bible says. You know what, you know what off-scouring is? You, you guys, some of you haven't brushed your teeth. That's right. <laughs> In days. Yep. Hey, Amen. <laughs> and when you get home, you're going you're gonna to off-scour some, some crud and mud and, 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 and plaque and white stuff and stank. Off scouring, and that, that's that's what that's what Christ truly was when he was on this earth, from the worldly standpoint. Now those that loved him loved him yeah. truly and saw him. Right. You got Mary washing his his feet with her hair. You, you, right. got, you got people crying on on, on his feet, lauding him and worshiping. Of course, there was always those that knew who he was because he had revealed himself unto them. But right. by and large, he was nobody. That's right. So when Moses says a prophet like unto me, he's, you see God in me, that prophet, showing right. his strength. Amen. You're also going to see aspects of me in him. Right. He's going to come lowly. He's going to come meek. The Bible said of Moses, he was the meekest man in the That's earth until right. Christ entered in. Right. <laughs> Amen. Meek, lowly, riding on Amen. a colt. Right. Yeah. Right? That's right. That was his triumphant entry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So just for a moment, let's just let's just kind of picture ourselves where we're at right now. Are you on a hill today? You got the promises of God in your ear and you're just watching them be fulfilled? Are, are, are you riding on high with the Lord and He's there with you and you're rejoicing and you're celebrating and you're always happy and everything is, is just wonderful? Well, hey, be, be, be confident in that. Enjoy that. Amen. Truly, it's, it's, it's a blessing, and I'm happy for you. I'm, I'm blessed by that. But as was the word of the prophet, so I say today, take yep. heed, beware, watch, yeah. be careful. Right. There's a battle coming Right. within the year. I think sometimes our challenges come in seasons. It seems. Amen. <laughs> yep. Within the year, though you're up on the hill, your next battle may be in the valley. Yep. And you may go to a dark place. Right. And you may be sad and disgruntled and frustrated and, and hurting and, and suffering loss. And you haven't heard a 
word from God. You haven't heard a promise of, of this great challenge being, being destroyed from before you and God overcoming, showing himself to be the Lord. You haven't heard it. Right. So you're suffering down in that valley. Trust the word. Amen. You say, oh, I haven't heard God's promise. Well, here you go. Go to, go to 1 Kings 20. Amen. There's that promise. Sometimes it seems like it's a little too late, doesn't it? You're already, you're already facing the biggest challenge you've ever seen in your life. Two little flocks before multitudes and multitudes coming against you to yep. destroy you. And you're just like, man, there is no way I'm getting out of this. God, where are you? Don't you see me? Yeah, he does. See Jesus. Amen. He's there. Right. He's on your hills. He's on your valleys. Amen. He's always there. Right. Amen. He is touched by the feelings of our infirmities. Right. He knows how we hurt. He right. knows how we suffer. He knows right. how things get hard and challenging. He knows how weak and frail we are. Right. Amen. He's relatable. You imagine that for a moment. That, that <clears throat> God relates to you and you can actually relate relate to God. That was the whole purpose of, of Christ coming to this earth as, as the sinless Lamb of God to be yeah. slain. But, but, but truly, he, he came to experience us, to know us from, from, from beyond. He came to walk with us, talk with us. Be in the garden with us, be on the hills with us, be on the valleys with us, and he's still doing that today. He knows. He's right. relatable, and in many ways, he's on our level. Right. He even understands what it's like to be a child. That's right. <laughs> Yet without sin. Yeah. You know, yeah. Right? But he knows the temptations. He knows the trials. He knows the struggles. <coughs> he knows how, how, how girls like to bicker with one another and hurt each other's feelings with their mouths. Now, boys like to bicker with their fists and hurt each other in other ways. Right? Amen. Right. He knows what it's like. Right. That's right, preacher. As strong as God is in Christ, he became weak. Right. Believe as Paul did that when you are weak, then are you strong? Amen. Right? And that's a that's a promise from God that you can take with you. You're feeling weak, you're feeling low, you're feeling like you're in a valley. Hey, when you're weak, then you're at your strongest. Look right. at the difference in the in the battles that just took place. Right. You, know? you saw them take over a few thousand when they were on the hills and they had the promise of God before them. They didn't have to go with a lot of faith because they already knew they were gonna have the victory. <coughs> so many were destroyed. Right. Then when they walked before the great multitude, having a year of preparing and planning and scheming and worrying and all of the things that go into us before we go into a battle like that, he, he looks, he sees what he's facing, and God then, only then, gives the word, 100,000 are destroyed that day. Yeah. When Ahab... As rotten of a king as he was, was at his weakest, then was God's strongest. Amen. 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 Amazing. Amazing. And that gives a lot of hope to me. I don't know about you, but... Amen. <laughs> I do not feel like the first side of Moses' proclamation very often. Right? That Christ is just, just seen in me all the time. You know. I'm fallen. I, I find myself... I find myself suffering and struggling more than I ought to because I know I need to just <clears throat> claim those promises and walk in the Spirit. But hey, I just mentioned earlier, 25 years of walking in this world has put a stain on me. Yeah, amen. Yeah. Yeah. But, when I'm weak, amen. I admit it, yeah. God's strongest statement. Amen. Right, preacher. There it is, that promise. That's right, Take brother. that. Amen. It's yours. What a good God we have. Just Amen. be glad. Just be glad that God's been here. That God's experienced what you're experiencing. Amen. In so many ways. And just be glad that He's willing to do it again and 
again and again and again in order that he would get glory and you would know that he is the Lord. Amen. Amen.